Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the world's best investing podcast. Look at this graph on the screen. What do you think is happening? You have the S&P 500, the black line, and then total job openings, which is the blue line. Many arguments, like, you know, rates went up, companies are getting leaner, or they tried to get leaner in 2022 and have actually been succeeding since. Many theories. But qualitatively, if you speak to any friend of yours, maybe that's looking for a job, or you yourself are looking for a job, you'll know, as Powell said a few months ago now, that we are in a low fire, low hire environment. So obviously senior people that have much of the valuable judgment are still very valuable, but then you have a lot of young people that don't have any judgment and the company basically has to invest in training them and taking a percentage of them to a position in which they are eventually useful and have enough judgment. What's happening, I think, is that actually ChatGPT is replacing a lot of those people. Then in Western nations, hiring people is a very dangerous, very complex thing because you have to pay a lot of taxes. There's a lot of legal risk, especially in Europe and stuff like that. In the US, I don't think you have as much of that, but I just don't think people are hiring young people anymore. I have a bunch of friends. They're looking for a job. They've been in finance for a few years. These are sort of classically trained people that have been doing a job in traditional classic finance companies uh, with with relatively linear approaches, and now they're struggling to find a job. And, and that's what's happening. I think that AI is essentially replacing those low-level jobs. So a week ago, I made a video about AI's emerging mathematical capabilities. So if you look at the papers about GPT-5 taking on mathematical tasks, it's not the conclusion. My conclusion, having read these papers in a lot of depth, is that and it's the same, by the way, of the researchers writing the papers themselves, is that these mathematical capabilities do not replace a top-level researcher or even just an average senior one. But it does feel a little bit like working within with a sort of young, recently graduated PhD. The thing that was very interesting is that these AI models begin to understand mathematical concepts, which are abstract. And, and, and they do so at a level which is higher than 99% of humans. I made that video. You guys should check it out. I also sent out a written form of the update. But what you see is that somehow via natural language, AI models are starting to comprehend these mathematical abstractions. For example, GPT-5 emerged, exhibited a clear ability to understand what a random distribution is rather than just looking at the numbers at face value. And then it understood how to compare distributions in terms of the sensitivity of the fourth moment of each distribution to changes in the underlying noise. That's pretty extraordinary. What this tells you is that actually these models have a capacity to reason, which is it's, it's better than we expected. The other thing that I look at is Alex Karp's face. I saw a video of him yesterday on Fox and I can see it in his eyes. This thing is accelerating like crazy. You can see it by the deals. Um, generally, I think AI is beginning to be a lot more useful than people do believe. Now, do I think this is sort of employment Armageddon? No, I think that eventually people adapt and figure out how to use this. So if, if, you, if you make content and you sell a product, which you make once and sell a billion times, then AI is just wonderful for you because it magnifies the reach. So there's, I think people are going to shift towards jobs that, um, that have AI as a tailwind. But in the meanwhile, my null hypothesis for now is that we're going to see a few years of disconnect. There's a lot of people employed in traditional jobs uh, with a linear mindset, and we have exponential improvements in AI capability every single month, I would say. And so I think there's going to be a disconnect and maybe a little bit of turmoil. That's just a null hypothesis. And it's, it's really, I mean, I don't do macro investing, but it's relevant to sort of get a feel for what's happening in the AI space because, you know, for the past few weeks, actually for the past few months, people have been crying that this is an AI bubble. Conversely, it's also fairly likely, so the odds are meaningful too, that actually what we have is an employment bubble at the moment. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't make investments based on one or the other. As you guys know, I'm just looking at free cash flow per share increments. And I try, I try to understand the drivers that push free cash flow per share higher. But in all of my companies like AMD, Tesla, Palantir, Duolingo, him, Spotify, AI is a clear tailwind and it's just increasing the top line and increasing margins. And so this is a very interesting trend um, for a number of reasons. As I was saying, this, this sort of 
I, I lean towards believing we're not in an AI bubble because if you look at the free cash flow per share of these companies, they're just going up exponentially. And if so, the interpretation, the correct interpretation of this graph is likely that what you actually have is an employment bubble, which is interesting. Then simultaneously, I think people are going to be rapidly shifting towards areas of the economy, which have been relatively stagnant for the past decade. One of them is medicine. Um, as you guys know, I'm particularly worried about this factor, which is somewhat weakening immune systems worldwide. And I think one, people haven't realized this yet. Two, a lot of people are dealing with this condition without knowing it. Three, I think a lot of capital is going to flow in that direction. So that's also pretty relevant for companies like Hims and, and even Novo and Lilly and a lot of companies. The whole value chain of medicine, I think, is about to be supercharged and I think actually what's happening is we're moving towards a Star Trek kind of scenario in fast motion. So I think in five years time, it's more likely than not that AI comes to be this thing, which, which does a lot of the work we do today automatically and sort of commoditizes that away such that the current economy becomes, gets compressed into an API. So we think the, the current economy is very big. You know how you guys, you guys know I've said many times that Palantir and Tesla are $20 trillion companies in the making. Obviously, people at the um, you know, the banks and stuff, when you say stuff like that, it's, it's too nonlinear, right? But what's clearly happening right now is that a lot of what we consider work in the economy, and that's sort of the holy grail for us because it's so big and we can't have anything that's exponentially bigger, is going to get compressed into an API. So we're just going to query that. That's what's happening right now. If you look at the mathematical capabilities, it's pretty obvious that is say by chat GPT seven, you're going to have a pretty top level maths researcher. It's just obvious as you throw more parameters at this thing, the level of intelligence and the generalized nature of it just keeps going up. And that's what I think is going to happen. So I, I think that a lot of essentially everything today is going to get compressed into an API. Then humanity is going to move towards areas which until now we couldn't really afford to focus on, which is longevity fundamentally on the medical side. And then that obviously includes a lot of things like self-actualization and actual happiness. I think that in seven to eight years time, we're going to look back at the economy and, and kind of essentially come to believe that we, we, you just won't be able to believe how miserable people were because you were doing stuff which actually can be highly automated by machines. So in terms of investments, I'm not changing my strategy at all. I'm just holding singularity scalers. So, you know, you have a lot of people getting depressed as we go into earnings and then emerging even more depressed after that, focused on quarterly beats and misses and stuff. I saw people doing that with Palantir, which as many of you know, I'm a very early shareholder in this company since $7. I saw people congratulating each other because they, because they, they, they were so accurate about the quarters. And so then they would buy and sell and, and buy and sell puts and stuff like that. And, and today they're all still poor, right? Because they missed on a 25 fold increase and the 25 fold increase is just tracking free cash flow per share. Like if you see the company's value creation process, it's all about deploying digital twins faster and making them more useful. And so this, this thing we are seeing here, which is a dislocation between the S and P 500 and total job openings is the very same thing that's powering free cash flow per share of that company. So. I think that singularity scalers are going to turn out to be the best investment thesis of this decade. And I think it's going to carry on for decades because it's, it's all going to be about, do you have the best ontology in your space that gives you the best and highest quality data and that therefore enables you to automate processes better than anyone else and do so more cost effectively while printing more cash that you can then reinvest to make the infrastructure better and get further ahead. And all of that, the competition is going to happen at the margin. So at the moment, you see people, when I say a given company doesn't have competition, you see people getting very upset about it. Well, what do you mean? Like, look at this graph. You have all this competition. Yes, but in the digital space, a marginal advantage in user experience translates into an exponential advantage in adoption. So I just see the odds of that playing out successfully continue to go up. And what I think is that as people continue to cry that this is a bubble and stuff, we're going to go into earnings and sometimes companies, companies will beat, sometimes they will miss. But overall, the value creation processes of the correct companies will just continue accelerating. One great example of that is Duolingo. 
and and by the way, actually, let me let me take a step back. When I was reviewing the maths paper that I that I was telling you guys about, I was actually using ChatGPT to learn, and that's how I quickly understood. Uh, apart from learning about the maths concepts, which I'm not a maths guy, but I think I can I can learn that stuff very quickly. Apart from learning myself by using ChatGPT, I realized that ChatGPT had a sufficient understanding of the concepts to teach it to me. So that's very bullish. But then people say, well, if I learn, if if say Antonio, you learned maths with ChatGPT, so why on earth would you just would you use Duolingo? And the answer is that actually, if you have a little bit more data than ChatGPT about what actually makes people learn and what pushes them through the learning process, you're just going to produce an exponentially better service that dollars are going to tend to accrue to. So it's actually bullish. What people see as the bare thesis is bullish because if ChatGPT can teach you math now, it means that Duolingo is going to be an AI math tutor. That's basically what it means. So long as they maintain the top decile culture and the ability to just iterate faster than ChatGPT can. Why do I know that is, why do I believe the odds of that are high? Because if you look at the interface for ChatGPT, it's generic. It can't possibly be specialized. It might tend to be specialized over time, but for now, it's just not going to outpace a team of humans that's thinking about what highly engaging features to bring to the marketplace that keep people more engaged. So Duolingo has this thing, which is called Chat with Lily, which is you literally talk to an AI. And, and that's the odds of that being just one of N features that they deploy that keep people more engaged is actually quite high. So it's all about, do you have a marginally better user experience? And then if you do, you're going to yield a data advantage, which is then going to translate into an exponential user advantage over time. That is how competition works in the digital space. That is how we've seen many of these things play out. So remember, just two or three years ago, people thought that uh, that uh, Palantir had a lot of competition. Turns out they don't because no one does a unified sort of a a, a done for you uh, digital twin approach that's so seamless. You have a lot of other solutions that you can you can scrap together and produce something that's like it, but it's not quite. And so as they take an additional step forward in productization, the effect is logarithmic. So this graph that I'm putting again on the screen, together with the fact that free cash flow per share is exploding, together with the fact that I see people struggling to get jobs, especially people that just recently graduated, to me, tilts the odds towards we actually have an employment uh, bubble versus an AI one. As I said, big impact on society, at least in the short term. I think people are going to have to get repurposed. And then for people that invest in singularity scalers, I think that the odds of massive, rapid, wealth creation that makes you fundamentally unrelatable to the rest of the population is high. Like, I, I don't like what's happening in society. I don't like what's happening in terms of this divide that I'm seeing, this bifurcation between people that are invested or generally leverage AI and people that are not. I don't like what I'm seeing biologically. And by the way, there's solutions to it because now we can increasingly print a molecule of any shape and have it perform a specific function inside the body. I don't like it but I'm just trying to get on the right side of history. And, and, and that's what I believe many of you guys are doing, have done, so congratulations for that. Um, so anyways, I'll get back to doing research. As you know, I'm very, very focused on the biology side of things. It, it's, I, I promised myself I wouldn't talk about biology because you know there's a lot of uh, overlords here involved and, and it's kind of dangerous and stuff, but there's a massive overlap with investments too because biology is sort of the next frontier which, which, by the way, I think when, when you're writing something like, say, the internet or AI, or AI, excuse me, it's kind of hard to imagine, like, what's next? What can possibly come along that makes this look silly? And the, actually, the internet is going to be a key enabler of the biology platform, but it's just going to be one of the building blocks, a primary one, but it's going to be abstracted away in the background. So it's a little bit like electricity back in the day. People were probably wondering what can possibly be bigger than this. Then electri electricity became a primary enabler of the internet. And now no one even thinks about electricity apart from iron shareholders and, and people that realize that now we actually have a bottleneck in that component. But where this is going is we are going to have do not die, not dying as a service or living forever in relative terms as a service. And that's the next big, huge thing. So when I see people going into him's earnings depressed because of credit card data and stuff, I think that you are missing the point. I think that humanity's end game is staying along for a long time and being fulfilled. And because of this thing that we're seeing in the graph that I was showing you and all these qualitative observations, 
we are now about to be headed in that direction at warp speed. And, and that's where my eye is. That's where my attention is focused right now. It goes extremely, extremely deep. So if you look at the various Trojan ho horses we've had over the past few years, they operate in this extremely intelligent, extremely deep way. And, and the rabbit hole is just so deep and it involves so many crucial organs and glands and different kinds of peptides and different molecules and so many different pathways. I don't know who the hell de designed this, but they're so good at it. And so we're just catching up with them now. And, and that increasingly illustrates to me how deep this is going to go and how much in turn, how much upside you have. So it is scary and it is troubling, but I think uh, at the other side of that, we're just going to emerge with a lot of upside, kind of like 2022 rates going up and stuff, scary. But then after that, we emerged with a lot more upside. The positive way of seeing this is that this is actually a trampoline for humanity. You see that I speak it in, in Morse code a lot, but I think that the overlords are here algorithmically too. And, and you can't really speak very bluntly about this. But if the people that know will know. So if you know, you know. Uh, we're paying a lot of attention and I think we're going to be very successful and we are going to avert a lot of pain. So anyways, guys, I'll get back to research. As I was saying, thank you very much for your attention today. So thank you so much for being here, for your likes, your subscriptions, your comments. If you enjoyed this, could you please share this with just one friend whom you think will enjoy it? As you know, these deep dives and updates are for free. And so the only way this grows is with your help. So stay focused on the fundamentals. Don't be uh, too concerned if you find that linear thinking is not working because it won't and it increasingly will not work. And see you guys next time.